back to theCUBE here. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. Thanks, Adam, in the studio. We got two entrepreneurs here, co-founders of Last Mile Exchange, Andrew Hoskin and James Grant. Guys, thanks for coming on theCUBE. John, great to be here. Love to get the entrepreneur, get both co-founders, making yep. it happen. I mean, the pandemic was either a tailwind or a headwind for companies, and certainly the internet didn't break, everything worked out great. No, exactly. <laughs> so, so, let's just jump in. Let's, before we get into some of the questions, what, what does LMX do? Who are you guys? Take a quick minute to explain what you guys do. Sure, so we're a, we're a software provider. We have a cloud-based SaaS platform, which effectively, it's a bit like a, a Skyscanner or an Expedia for networks. Carriers need to buy and sell networks from each other, and we help them do that and uh, we have been in the cloud since day one, and so it's what we do while we're here, and it's a good place for us to tell you about it. I got I to gotta ask you, because one of the things, being an entrepreneur, you got to read the tea leaves. One of the, the secrets of being a co-founder and doing anything entrepreneurial these days is you got to see the future, but then you got to come back to the present and yeah. convince everybody what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> what is the core value proposition? What, what's, what's the day in the life of a conversation? I mean, you're talking to Martians now, like, huh, what's the public cloud? It's like, is it like, isn't it just the internet? It's changing. What's the pro value proposition? What's the conversation like? So the, uh, yeah, the, the value prop proposition for us is that we, um, you know, we work with our customers to sort of accelerate the, the sales um, cycle through, through cloud-based services. So a lot of our customers are global tier one carriers who are looking to automate their, their connectivity pricing, and we do that for our cloud-based solution. So it is you know, vital to us, um, and particularly with having customers all across the globe, being able to sort of deploy cloud-based services makes life much easier. I got to ask you, one of the things that we love about cloud is the agility. Yeah. Okay, talk about the impact of what you guys are offering for the agility side. What's the impact to the consumer, the application developer? What's the, what's the impact? Cloud's had a big, big play for us, big impact um, for our customers. So we provide our solution effectively, almost a plug and play for them. So we do quoting, really, really well. You want to know where a network is, you want to know connectivity, we'll sort that out for you. And we can give you a solution that they can plug into their systems really quickly. In terms of, for us, when we first started, we had servers in, in data centers and managing software on that, but we, we moved to Amazon pretty early. And um, what we now have is we can spin up a new customer environment in a day, which, you know, from previously two, three weeks. So cloud has been transformational for us and hopefully for our customers as well. And you guys target mainly carriers? Very much so, yeah. We're, we're very much in the in the big carrier telco space, um, the people that provide the, the fabric upon which all of this, this yeah. sits. Yeah, and then by the way, it's magic and this, it's robust, it's, 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 it's what we need, it's utilities, it's important. Um, last mile, obviously, as, as uh, we all, some people look at it and say, go back decades. Broadband, yeah. you know, last mile is always that last nut to crack. Yeah. 5G's here. Yeah. The mobile sector is looking at massive growth. You're starting to see the cloud providers recognize that the edge is just a, another network connection. Yeah, absolutely. How do you guys see that evolving? What's going on? How do you see that affecting your business, the customers on the market? Well, so network, I mean, access is all about getting onto the network, whether, whether you're talking cloud or whatever. So if you can't get onto the network, cloud is nothing. If you can't sort of backhaul your 5G, you're stuck. So what we're seeing is even with 5G, as it rolls out, as people look to densify their networks, they still need to get all that voice traffic, all that data traffic onto fiber. So we're seeing a lot of interest there still in knowing where connectivity options are, knowing where the network is. But James also, I mean, that other aspect of access, 10 years ago was all about fiber, but you were just telling me before about how increasingly carriers are using 5G as like effectively a router in a box, ship it via DPD or, or FedEx out to a customer. And yeah, so. yeah so, so typically we'll think about mobile as connecting a mobile phone, but now we're looking at sort of mobile connecting buildings. And one of the key yeah. challenges when you're connecting a building with mobile is what the actual connectivity within the building is. So often we will see mobile maps that show you the, the sort of connectivity at the sort of the outside level. But of course, you're actually going to have your, your infrastructure in the building, so you need to know what the strength, signal strength is there. So we're actually working with a partner at the moment so that we can identify within a building what the quality of the signal is. I mean, that's classic. If you think about it, like most people think of, oh, it just drops to the end point, and then you got more network behind it, wireless. You got now two work at home, dynamics, yeah. IOT yeah. devices. Yeah. So you guys have the buy sell side of things going on. You got the carriers buying and selling there. Yeah, absolutely. And then SD WAN's a huge market that's growing mm -hmm. and absolutely. as absolutely. well. 
and, and, and all of that relies on access. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you can you can talk 5G, you can talk IoT, and, and of course those are, those are the exciting, sexy things in the industry. But underpinning all of that is is a network. And uh, you mentioned the word before, and it's right, utility. You know, maybe it's not the sexy side yeah. of things, but you've got to have it. Otherwise, nothing else works. You know, one of the things we do a lot of cloud coverage. We cover all the Amazon shows and here. Coming into Telco, yeah. the Telco digital revolution that's going on here. You can see it, yeah. and some people aren't ready for it. It's almost like it reminds me of the mainframe days yeah, back yeah. when I was growing up in college. It's like. Oh, I'm not, I don't want to do the mainframe. I'm the new guy, I'm the young kid. Yeah, yeah. I love this uh, PC and mini computers. Here it's the same thing, it's kind of like, okay, I see the cloud, but when you have infrastructure as code, yeah. everything gets fuzzy. Yeah. I mean, now you're talking about programmability, yeah. so that edge at the application level, some say is going to be a massive innovation enabler, yeah. which is going to change that infrastructure as code, which means that Guys like you guys could be able to provide programmable routes, programmable Yeah, policies. and APIs are, and, and the programmability of, of the network, the whole interplay from whether it's quoting, whether it's ordering, whether it's delivering services, whether it's kind of somebody going into somewhere and saying, I'd like 100 gig into this building, pressing a button and 15 minutes later, everything rolls together to turn it up, is, is where the whole industry's going. All right, let's take that for a second. Just a sure. mind-blowing scenario right there. Sounds simple. Yeah. Compare where we were just 15 years ago. Yeah that scenario didn't exist. No. And it's hard. Yeah, yeah. It's not trivial. No. Non-trivial. All right, so what's this mean for customers? Are they like buying this level now? Like, like, are they like, where are they on the spectrum of, you know, buying and, and the progression of operationalizing their business to be fully robust network end-to-end -end visibility on workloads to network? I, I would say it sort of often depends where the customer is. So obviously we, we deal with, with global customers and that's one of our big selling points is that uh, you know, a lot of people are focusing on the US, the Western European market, yeah. um, you know, and the connectivity challenges that they're trying to solve there. Our customers have global customers who are looking for connectivity all throughout the world, and often there'll be things like mining companies who don't have yeah. fiber going into them. So we, we need to be able to work with our customers and their suppliers to be able to automate everything because you can only fully quote a network when you've got all the locations back. And if you're waiting for information yeah. coming back from Africa or from the former CIS, then you know, you're going to have a problem. And we're working with companies in Africa and Russia, Kazakhstan at the moment to help them automate everything. You know, it's interesting. I just, my mind just goes nuts here when thinking about what you guys do because as people start rolling their own with applications, yeah. they're going to need to have this programmability like almost on demand. Like, yeah. They're going to need to have I want to do a digital TV network, I want to provision something, yeah. or something's hybrid or at exactly. the edge. You've got a football game or you've got something like this where you need capacity, you need it quickly, you need it yeah. for an event. Yeah, yeah. exactly, and 5G's perfect. Yeah. I mean, how many times have we all been at a, at a soccer game or a football game, it's like, I got bars but I have no backhaul. Like, yeah, yeah. we've all been there. Yeah. Why, oh, there's yeah. 20,000 people. saturated the network and everyone's <laughs> doing the same thing. <laughs> the radio's working, yeah, yeah. the backhaul's choking. I mean, this is real. Absolutely. Um, how does, does 5G solve that? I mean, where does that get, how does that get solved? I mean, is it going to be ubiquitous? Truly, 5G is going to make us all work better? I mean, certainly for the end user, 5G is, it provides speed, it provides capacity, and also for the operators, it provides being able to get more people onto it. And, and so, and 5G is not my core strength, but it absolutely will be transformative. What I can comment on is, like you say, for an event like this, or the football, or, or anything, the, the Euros, it ultimately goes into a pipe, so you've got to make sure that you've got to have the right connectivity there and the right capacity there from the user's phone, through the towers, all the way into the network, all the way to the data center and back again. So the edge, everything has to, to play together to do that and probably rolling that out quickly and making sure it's, it's agile, making sure it's fast and making sure it's quick and, and reliable that's what needs to all work together. And, I, I like and, how you said you're the Expedia of the networks. Yeah. So that instantly, in my mind, says, okay, ease of use. Yeah. From mm -hmm. a consumption standpoint. Yeah. What's the next level of growth for you guys? I'm almost imagining it's programmability or cloudifying it or amplifying it, making it. Yeah, certainly we are, we are, we are going to continue to push into, you know, effectively, digital transformation, in fact, across telecoms is happening. You would think that it would be a lot further ahead than it is. It's, it's not. There are a lot of people still quoting, ordering manually. So we're, we're very much part of that. Um, but certainly the ordering and the provisioning, like we've mentioned, that's, that's a big part for, for the industry and we're going to hopefully be part of that or we expect to be part of that. Um, so that, and, and making sure that connectivity is, is there when you need it. Yeah. You know, I'm here, what's there, a bit like flights. I'd like to fly to New York. Who can do it? How much will it cost? 
I'll buy that one, please. Yeah. And that's what network, sh network should be as well. James, what's your vision on how the customers are progressing in their mindset? Obviously, you've got some blocking and tackling to do. You're in the market. Where are they going with the use case and the application? Look, the customers are getting to the stage where they're expecting to be able to go into a portal and turn up services. So with, as with many things that we're seeing sort of throughout life today, you can go into an app, you can press a couple of buttons and you can, you can order something. So that, that's what they're expecting is to be able to just go and say, I need 100 meg here, press a few buttons and in 10 minutes time the circuit's not only quoted but it's, it's provisioned. Now, at the moment there's a sort of a, a digital divide between those that have the digitization in, process, in place and those that don't. And, and that, that's the sort of the key that we're trying to sort of help the industry with is the sort of the, the outliers and, and also the, the, the main carriers to make sure that it's not a sort of a digital haves and a digital have nots. Yeah, I was just going to say that. So, so if you have the digital haves and have nots, is that a function of them just not being operationalizing their digitization or is it they're not set up for, they don't have you guys? What's the have not side of it? How do they become the haves? Well, one of the one of the biggest challenges is actually around the sort of identifying the connectivity at a particular location. So in, in some countries it's very easy to do like the, the US, UK, Netherlands, we have nice sort of standard yeah. address formatting and you can identify a building at, at roof level and, and when it comes to you know turning up connectivity straight away you want to make sure that you turn up the connectivity to the right building. Yeah, exactly. And and that, that's one of the challenges that we're seeing throughout sort of you know, sort of some of the Eastern European and the, sort of the, the LATAM, the Asian and the African markets. I mean, we saw what happened with Amazon instances. You got spot instances, you got reserve instances. Yeah. You're starting to see that mindset. That's a SaaS mindset. Yeah. That's kind of where things are going. Is that, do yeah, you guys yeah. see the same thing here or is it different? Yeah, well, I mean, certainly in the enterprise space, tend, they tend to make decisions over longer scale, so they're maybe yeah. maybe not so much, you know, that you sign contracts in a year's term, et cetera. But yeah, certainly as, as a, provider, a SaaS provider, using all those yeah. things. Um, the ability to, to tune your expenses, tune your cost, even your resource, you know, turning up servers by the hour, by the minute, is, is a big thing. Um, and it takes a mindset change um, for us and our customers. You know, mind, if you don't mind me asking, how long have you guys been doing this business as co-founders? When did it start? What was the guiding principle? How do you guys look back now? And James and I met working for Verizon uh, many years ago, you might have heard of them. Uh, and, and we sort of did what we do now in as much as James ran the commercial side of things, I ran the software side of things. Um, and, and we saw that connectivity was a universal problem. Um, and so we saw an opportunity, we went out, we started Last Mile Exchange. We pivoted once or twice, still in the same space. Um, but we eventually realized that where we are now was, was what the industry needed, and that's where we've been pushing now for quite a few years. I want to give you guys a lot of credit and a lot of props. Congratulations. Oh, I think you know, the digital divide has been a broadband challenge for many, many years and decades. Now you've got that urban divide where people don't have access, and I yeah, heard yeah, stories yeah. during the pandemic that you know, people had access in the region, but couldn't get it to the home, affordability, access, devices. Yeah. These are new issues, the digital divide, they have connectivity options, yeah. but it's not really clear yet. Yeah. So yeah. you're starting to see a lot more of that going on. Of course, the rural areas. Well, yeah. well, I, I live out in the countryside on a farm, so I'm quite used to the challenges <laughs> of, of connectivity. And I, when I first moved into my house, I ended up having to get two-way satellite broadband. And things, things have improved now, but when we're talking about 5G, uh, you know, people in London, they have 5G. 5G is something that I'm not going to see for yeah. Three, four equally, years probably. Globally, it'll democratize access because, mm. like we were saying, we're seeing it in enterprise. You can send out a router or a router with a with a SIM card in it. I mean, you can give a kid a mobile phone in in the middle of you know Kenya, and he can have access to the world yeah. through the internet. So you know that increased capacity, that increased you know densification of networks. Yeah. Okay, they're not all going to be on 5G today. James hasn't got 5G, and he only lives 30 minutes out of London. Yeah, yeah. But um, you know. 3G, 4G, I think the gentleman on, on one of the keynotes was talking there about 3G+. Plus. You know, effectively that's going to roll out. The 5Gs yeah. are going to be in New York's and London, but yeah. it's going to make it, a It's difference. going to be, be, bring your own G to, to your house uh, soon, and I think the space ops is going to be great. Yeah. Um, and I think overall, just overall the challenges on the topologies. You're going to start yeah. to see diversity in the network topology, and that's yeah. just going to explode. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's going to be super exciting. Well again, 
I think you guys are under something big. I think this idea of sassifying, making things programmable, yep. infrastructure as code is going to be pretty big, so thanks for coming on. And what's your take real quick of Cloud City? It's been great. We, we've just walked in, we've both said, as we came in, we came in yesterday to set up and, and we were really blown away. And the rest of our team arrived today and, uh, and, and they were very impressed as well. And I was going to say, Telco DR and the team have done a, a really impressive I, job yeah. here. I, I, I think you have to come here and see it to believe it right. because when we walked in, it was just like, this place is stunning. Awesome. Yes. Well, this is theCUBE coverage. We're rocking and rolling here. We're going back to the studio to see Adam and the team. Back to you.